may never see the last of day by a lovely old journalist in London Club. And this woman asks her, when did you first realise you could sing? So I'm going to do a short extract from the first bit of the book, and then a slightly longer scene for a bit later. Girls' voices break too. I never knew before it happened, but they do. The voice I knew, high as a flute, capable of switching smoothly between one register and another, left me by the time I was 12. Instead, what I had was something heavier and harder to predict, a foreshadowing of the deep, bluesy voice I'd end up with. I'd learned to love it, but at the time it just felt like everything else, uncontrollable. I was not a looker in those days. I had dull, tangled hair, tender new breasts pushing against my thin, small sweaters, and a tendency to trip in the hallways while dreaming of another life. I was a mess. My thighs rubbed, sweat circles bloomed under my arms, and I bitterly resented all the girls around me who managed to hold on to their childhood bodies just a little bit longer. I was still proud that I was the first girl in my class to get my period, though my mother had wept. You're so bloody young, she kept repeating, before pulling it together and going to the corner shop for chocolate and nappy thick sandwich pads. I could sense her confusion when she presented them to me. The chocolate was what she'd soothed me with when I was much younger than this. Frankly, she was floundering, and so was I. I had friends, other studious, slightly uncool girls, but my place in the school hierarchy was painfully low. My arch enemy was a girl called Gina Lennon. As Lennon was playground slang for lesbian at the time, I took a lot of pleasure in her name, but I couldn't think of anything else about her that was broad. Gina was skinny, flat as a board, mousy hair pulled back, toffee smooth, narrow thighed, and her designer laid with jeans. In the trailing skirts I stole from my mother, mirrored hippie blouses and knuckle duster earrings, I scared the hell out of this anemic girl, and frankly, she frightened me too. Gina had decided that I was a lesser, which at least meant that she was smarter than she looked. After she shared this insight with my class, they treated me as if I had a communicable disease, but we didn't really know what gayness was, I certainly didn't. All I knew was that I was already indefensibly other, with my woman's hips, foreign features courtesy of mum's European and dad's Irish blood, my flannel shirts and velvet goth gowns. When I think about that girl, I know how frightened she was. I know she was much braver than I am now. I did have crushes on girls, but it wasn't a wildly sexual thing. I dreamed about closeness, soft skin against mine, a whisper perfume in the air. I lived every day in a haze of longing, like child into sneaking cookies out of the tin downstairs as I watched another snow collection movie. I had a crush on my drama teacher. One evening after school, she took us into the music hall so we'd all get a chance to sing. The other girls chose songs from the musicals. I think I would have two, but instead I chose a song from one of my mother's blues albums. One we sang together in the car with the windows down because I wanted to make the statement. On the first verse, I could barely hear myself. On the second, something happened. Another kind of break, but a good one. Some people say they've been touched by angels. My angel was a fat, laughing, black-winged one with whiskey and perfume and grease on the chin. I had a voice big enough for cathedrals, dirty enough for brothels, and above all, loud. Within five minutes, I went from being a dumpy girl to a small goddess. It wasn't about me anymore. My hair, my sweat, my temper, my dreams, it was something bigger than me. It was the closest to religion I would ever get. Wow, said the music teacher when I was done. I thought right now I could just run a marathon or even an 18 ounce steak or had an orgasm. The class was silent, all of them wearing the same surprised expression. I looked at Gina Lennon, saw the naked dislike on her face, and grinned. Usually she just ignored me, but I figured if she hated me, then I must be something. So Evie also gets into performing at burlesque clubs, which is something that I've done a couple of times. And I have to see when um, she is performing at a place that bears more than a passing resemblance to Madame Jojo's. I'm not a burlesque artist, so I can't pair for burlesque shows, which is a bit of a cheat to be honest, but I really can't dance. And it's sort of a dream of mine to hang out backstage with very beautiful women in sparkles, so uh, this has given me the ability to write scenes such as this. Evie is at a burlesque night with a new friend who goes under the name of Final Lace, which is her stage name. And uh, she's just basically waiting to go on with final backstage at this burlesque venue where Evie is going to sing and the other girls are going to show me her tail. <clears throat> the MC, the course to cross between a lively chick and Bette Midler, puts her head round the door and says, 
Five minutes, ladies. Who's she calling ladies? Final matters. This isn't the bloody civil. Going on after her probably isn't the best idea, especially after a night of chaos. One of the drag queens decides to double the length of her set, despite or perhaps because of the audience's studied apathy. Vi gets into a foul mood, muttering homicidally about how the end of the pure divas and how she's seen better drag in brass history. The main band, a trio of gangly, sharp-seated lads who look collectively about 14, take liberties with their own lot of time. And one of the other girls' singers refuses to come out of the dressing room because all her entourage can't get in for free. All of this makes them seem better than looking increasingly menopausal. Once Lionel gets on stage, clattering into the spotlight with her teeth bared and her hair a rocky horror fright, she is taking no prisoners. By the time she finishes, pumping the stage to a hard rock hair flailing number that owes less to Velasco and more complicated strip dress, the crowd, previously a crew of polite middle class kids in retro suits, are whipped into a rich, soused lover, vain for war as she pulls out red heart shaped lollipops from her bra and tosses them into the crowd, finishing with an acrobatic tassel shake as she twirls her bra over her head. With Vinyl's applause, the first heartfelt primal roar of the night still in the air as she scampers into the crowd. I step out onto the stage, crack a few half-hearted dirty jokes which the warm-up crowd laughed up generously, and start to sing. Halfway through my first number, I realise something's wrong. After Vinyl's floor hunting, someone forgot about the sound, and the audience can barely hear me. Sweat breaks out between my shoulder blades. I like being up here, removed. I need to stay up here. But as my eyes adjust to the migraine strong wall of lights filled with the audience and faces mouthing, we can't hear you, emerge from the darkness, I finally reluctantly forget about distance. Trying to sing while keeping my balance square on these ridiculous shoes, I head down into the audience. I only get ten minutes with these people, and I want to get it right. Of course, I don't always do this stressed like a As I swear clumsily through the crowd, hamming it up a little, reaching to ruffle one of the band boys' hair and aiming suggestive glances at anyone, Look at me. I realise that after vinyl sex up triumph is open season out here. A hand snakes down and touches my hip. One guy tugs on the coffee cup of my skirt like a child seeking attention and then, as I turn around to try and walk further into the crowd, another hand reaches out from behind me, and accompanied by a chorus of football ground noises from pissed overgrown boys, reaches between my thighs. Blackness floods my head. I stand frozen for a moment. I never forget my words, but now my voice is left. My throat squeezed as though things were closing around it. The moment seems to last forever, and then, as though the sheer voltage of my rage was enough to do it, my microphone finally comes on just in time to catch an expletive. I turn around, aim a furious dominator, and stare at my assailant, a short arse with unfortunate shoe polish black hair that looks a bit like a toupee, even though he can't be more than 20. I pick up a half drunk pint, and without missing another note, pour it over his head. Carnage breaks out. I stop singing. In the past, I've competed with everything. From festival PA systems blaring floor volume grunge to chattering smokeheads to the roar of a dodgy generator, but even I have my limits. Shaky, confused applause breaks over me. The guys from the band are doubled over, whinnying with laughter. Then, in the heart of the chaos, I see my new friend in front of me, hands on her negligible hips, wearing only her pasties, her panties, and a dangerous grin. To a rampant chorus of whistles and screams, she steps up to me and plants her mouth on mine. She tastes like she smells. In century. Her mouth, smoky and alcoholic, has the smouldering tang of geranium petals. Vinyl plants are strong to hand on the back of my head, grinding her pelvis into mine. When she comes up for air, she hisses into my ear, lowest common denominator with it, doing what they want. She turns on her heel, shaking her hair over her shoulders. Right, a low, smoky voice somehow carries better than mine. Shut your faces and let the girls sing. One more time now for Evie Day. Relieved at being told what to do, they clap raggedly. I stand in the middle of the floor, their faces, eyes, breath too close for comfort. I'm near enough to see some of the girls looking down their powerful noses at me, a few of the guys unashamedly staring at my boobs, and a good helping of genuine boredom. Why do I do this? I think, as I try to remember the next song on my fag packet and eyeliner set list, and then launching into the intro, I answer myself. Well, I always answer myself. sitting down, so please um, allow me to use the space a bit, coming to the centre. 
it's kind of interesting. I wasn't really sure about the themes between, between all of our work, but I think it's been really interesting to sort of watch them being teased out as we go along. So I had no idea that I was going to be talking about periods and like those people who are talking about this kind of womanhood and blood and so on. So that's pretty fascinating. Um, but in terms of fantasy and vampiric stuff, I do have moments where I get a bit gothic. And this first one that I'm going to do was commissioned for an issue of Trespass magazine about monsters. And I kind of thought, well, what is monstrous? And uh, a mad woman in love is definitely one of them. I've been told that this is kind of a male voice. I don't think it is. I just think women can be just as crazy as guys sometimes. And this one, which I'm going to do for you first, is called The Monster in Me. I met you, a barefoot girl, not sure what this world might be. You settled in me, a pearl on the bed of a bitter sea bursting with flowers and candles and shoot out movie twists with crosses round my neck and holy water on my wrists clanking with rings and ankle chains I prayed that you wouldn't see something about your untouched skin unleashed the monster in me and made me a hard-faced diva with a stretched unblinking stare sobbed on drink and downers face like a painted prayer stiff as a thrift shop icon our lady trampling snakes a blank eyed bloodied saint who holds her locked off breasts like Offering you the platter, I threw my heart for free. Something about your unkissed lips unearthed the monster in me, and made me a snarling creature, my muzzle flecked with meat. Ready to kill and nuzzle, to mate and fight and eat, but not sure which I wanted, to be stroked by you or feed. Your pale surprise met my piss-gold eyes, narrow and hot with need. Turning in wounded circles, made me too tired to flee. Something in your uneven smile unnerved the monster in me and made me a skull collector, glinting in mirrored shades, an armored guard around me, and a crucifix of blades that could strip your skin down to chamois thin, my bloody valentine. I've kept your heart in my ice compartment, and that might make you mine. But when you said, no more of this, I want you, can't you see? Mm, something in that uncertain kiss unarmed the monster in me. And I left you, a barefoot girl, not sure what this world might be, stripped of the claws and clutter, empty, alone and free. Without the props and hunger, you know, we, we didn't quite convince. I couldn't stay a monster, and Lord knows I'm no prince because I'm human. And when push turn shove, we're just not meant to be. My not quite unrequited love undid the monster. because that's what heroin is it's thinking about doing. And I do spending your life in sort of Puritan flower sacks sounds absolutely <laughs> awful. But of course, as she points out, red is the colour of many things. And, you know, when you put it on, you know you're kind of signalling that something is going to happen. So this is basically a poem about doing the walk of shame. I do hope you enjoy it. It's called a Red Dress Blues. Last night, I put on my red dress, <laughs> strode to the bebop of blaring cars, high heels clicking through clutter, dressed for the gutter, drinking the stars ready to taste the bad girl's breath and slam my shot glass down. Lose the day in the night's dense depths and let tomorrow drown. Today, I got bedhead, like a nightshade vine. I stink of bonfire smoke and rot gut wine. But my mantel choir is singing, damn I'm fine. You got her guts to wear a dress. I don't give a damn what the teacher said, cause you know, life is short and we're a long time dead. I'm no angel, but I'm free to tread. My dress has to be red. And now I'm crumpled and bleeding from my battered satin feet. Sugar coated my split skinned lips like Mike at the girls' the street. Coffee in hand, heart at my throat, cushiony beat so loud. It blurs right through all that greyness like red silk in a suit clad crowd. You know, it's one fist clapping, not a valentine. You don't need trappings like a concubine or bags and wrappings boasting rich design. But you've got to have hips to wear a dress like mine. I don't give a damn what the preacher said because I'm reeling from the night in a stranger's bed. That face above me like a figurehead. Mm my dress has to be red. Today I woke in my red dress, flew past a milk float into the sun. Numbers scrunched in my pockets into the office, morning begun. I'm getting the strangest glances from all the other girls in pastels, but my head is full of dancers, and the air is piled with castles. You know, I shook it from my toes to my rolling spine. I acted devilish and felt divine. Got to make sweat to let your hot skin shine. You've got to have curves to wear. 
I don't give a damn about what Nietzsche said because there is a goddess and she's not dead. So give me roses and screw your bread because my dress has to be made. I'm just going to finish with a short one with another splash of red in it. And uh, yeah, more food for thought. This is a short poem inspired by Arnold Lane. It's on the bus and it's called Cherries in the Snow. There's a video of me doing it on YouTube where I had to sit in a bus shelter for hours on end. I don't recommend ever doing outdoor filming because it was absolutely freezing. The bus driver pulls off too fast. She falls, grabbing the wall. She's far too old to stand. Someone gives up their seat. In grubby shawl, she lurches in, and with a knotted hand dies, but a compact carbuncle with pearls and lipstick. Cherries in the snow. Her brand since she was just a mousy, restless girl, craving the sleek red wax, the golden band belting its black of black, the lazy twirl of scarlet silk. And later, the surprise of men in bars. A pout, a slick flicked curl, a red flag whipped before their startled eyes, and they were hurt. She lets herself remember the one who truly left and can't come back, but stirs in her with every dank November and poppies. Small explosions on the black of winter coats. Bathed in reflected light, she smiles. Her mouth, a metal scarlet to platinum. The old walls open, but her paint 